Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes, Steve's been tearing up stuff this morning. <laughs> and he's got the rack there and the tables. <laughs> And I, we have a wide assortment of stuff, <laughs> haven't we, Steve? <laughs> Are, ha, we have a couple of announcements. Are there any other announcements? No, nope, we've got it. Well, good morning, everybody. It is an auspicious morning. Uh, this is our good Earth Day Sunday. Uh, you know, we've had this every year with a different emphasis, and today we are going to be looking at the bzzy, 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 bees, the bees. And yeah, you're going to like this. And we are blessed and honored to have with us as a guest speaker, um, Lisa Stinson. She is a beekeeper, and she's also a member of the Seven Ponds Nature Center in Dryden. Raise your hand over there, Lisa. She's going to be our guest speaker, which means my sermon gets to be short. Yay! Uh, I'm sure you'll be happy about that. Um, Lisa will be with us right after the service. Now, I'm going to just be honest and upfront with all of you. This is a coffee hour you're not going to want to dash away from. Because not only are we going to have good caffeine and good goodies that Thelma has brought and fellowship, Lisa, of course, will be able to speak with you more about the topic of bees today. And if you see in front of us, we are blessed this morning with some seeds. You are not only going to be able to take home marigold seeds this morning to help the bees in your backyard, but also two other pollinators that help the bees and will help your garden. We have borage seeds and we have sunflower seeds that don't go any higher than three feet which is good for your patio or your backyard, you are not going to go away empty-handed this morning. So please hang around afterwards for um, fellowship and for some seeds. Lastly, uh, I call your attention to the uh, announcements of uh, activities that we have this week here at the church. Um, I will have office hours tomorrow from 9 to noon, so please come in, email, call me if you want to chat about something. I'd love to see you, and I will put a cup of coffee on for you. Also, uh, the strip teasers, of course, meet tomorrow night, and uh, the other activities, as Barb alluded to, are there as well for this week. So thank you. This morning, we're going to have our opening hymn, number 569, Touch the Earth Lightly.
call to worship. Somewhere a farmer rises early, so there will be eggs, bacon, cereal, milk, meat, fruits, and vegetables to nourish our bodies. Somewhere a farmer is mentoring a future farmer. God, as we gather today to give you thanks, we ask, ask a blessing, blessing on the farmer and, and all workers, workers in the fields, fields barns, and dairies. And dairies. We, we encourage a future of agriculture. Around us, someone is nur nurturing flowers, bees that pollinate flowers, grapes, sod, trees, a small garden, and so many other parts of your creation. God, as we gather today to give you thanks, we, we ask, ask your, your blessings, blessings for good, good earth. earth. On this Sabbath day, we honor those working to give us clean air and water and protect our streams, rivers, lakes, oceans, wetlands, forests, the mountains, and all animals. In this place of prayer, we give thanks, O oh God, of all creation. We ask a blessing on, on all who care for, for your creation. This is the day that you have made God. We give you thanks and rejoice for the newness of life offered us. We, we are glad for warmth, for green grass, for soft breezes, and the music of birds, and gentle raindrops upon our faces. On this new day of hope and new life, we are reminded that you dwell within us, God, and within all creation. We remember we are called to be partners with you, O God, in creation. We rejoice today in celebrating God's gift of life. Our prayer of confession. Creator God, you breathe your being into all creation and set us in a garden of wonders and delight. Today you ask, where are you? What have you done to protect creation? We grimace as we see the earth's degradation. Holy, Holy one, one, sometimes we relinquish our lives to a reality of our creation. creation. Forgive us. O oh God of love, you ask that we share the gifts of creation with all people near and far. Today you ask, where is your brother, your sister? We say, forgive us, God of love, that the earth in fullness is yours, the world and those who dwell in it. Remind us again that we must safeguard the gift of life and protect creation around us, that we see, feel, taste, smell, and touch. Show us again the river of the water of life in this country and city. Help us to respect the Earth's creatures and to use the Earth's resources carefully. Help us to realize this beautiful creation you have provided. Turn us back to you, source of life and words of assurance. Before industry, before economy, before agriculture, before all the systems of our own creation, there was love. There is still love, God's love for us, known no beginning and no end. Give thanks for we are a loved <coughs> and forgiven people. Amen. The scriptures reading this morning is taken from Genesis 1, 26, 29, 31, and from Isaiah 30, 23, Isaiah 10, 12. <clears throat> the first one. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. This is from 1, 31. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. 
He will give rain for the seed with which you sow the ground and bring the produce of the ground, which will be rich and plenteous. On that day, your cattle will graze in broad pastures. Isaiah 30. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love, break up your fa fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mary Lou. <clears throat> well, it's been interesting these last few years as we've done these services. If you remember, we had the good seeds a few years ago. Um, we've had a lot of different emphasis on areas and um, been thinking of bees quite a bit. And I was very happy to um, remember that just down the road in Dryden, we have the Seven Ponds Nature Center. And of course, going on the state's beekeeper website, none other than Lisa's name pops up. So again, we're blessed to have Lisa, who will be speaking here in just a minute, tell us more of what we can do. If you thumb through the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, you're going to see the word holy used a lot, quite a bit. Of course, it means in that context, our creator God, our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer, our God who is responsible for this planet we are blessed to live on, which our Good Earth Day event today focuses on. I think of holy in a lot of different contexts. Holy can be a place. I think of Moses on Mount Sinai. We are in this sanctuary, which is a holy place, especially with the uh, eternal flame above the altar. Holy place here at First Congregational Church, a place where we worship a God with reverence. To experience God and speak to God and thank God and ask God for help and praise, this is where we do it. Holy can also be, if you think about this, can be an encounter. Getting back to Mount Sinai, we remember how Moses spoke to God on Mount Sinai. And Moses being asked by God to remove his sandals because he was standing on holy ground. Holy, of course, can be a moment, can't it? In that encounter, we suddenly realize as it's going on, or maybe right after it's done, that in that short space of time, it could be a blink of an eye moment, something wonderful happens. We get goosebumps. The hair stands up on the back of our bodies because we have seen something. We have tasted something. We have experienced something that we just can't describe, something bigger than ourselves and beyond description. Beyond description is what, of course, we think about when it comes to God. I don't think there are adequate words in our human vocabulary to describe the holy and the moments of holiness that come along in our lives. When I think of our own holy places and encounters beyond what I've just described, I think of things like this, the birth of your children, the place where you proposed to your future husband or wife, a place to watch the sun rise and the sun set. Perhaps moments that your parents, your sister, or your brother played catch with you. You remember that scene from Kevin Costner's movie, where at the very end he plays catch with his father, which he never got to do earlier in his life, Field of Dreams. Back to those holy places, I think about the times in which I experienced the holy growing up in the Upper Peninsula holy mountains. I've talked about Sugarloaf before up there. For right now, my holiness besides this place and with all of you is really confined when it comes to the outdoors to my backyard. Where right now, just like you, I am hearing the robins chirping. I'm seeing the budding going on, the annuals, the perennials. 
the birds, the robins, our state bird. Did you notice that it seems like they came here a little earlier this year? Which is great because it reminds me of my old childhood because when I woke every morning at 633 West College Avenue in Marquette, the first thing I heard during the summer were the robins. And so when I hear the robins now, it is a reminder of my childhood. It is a reminder of my mother and father being just across the hall, my sister on the other side of my bedroom wall gives me goosebumps and it gives me security. The other day, I had a holy moment in terms of an encounter with a robin. And for me, it was a God moment. I got up from bed, and luckily, one of my bedroom windows faces the east, so I see the sunrise come up in the morning. So I pulled up the blinds like I normally do, and what do I see? literally five feet away from my bedroom window, looking up for me from the ground, taking a pause possibly from trying to hear that, that worm that's gonna be plucked from the ground, none other than a robin. The lo robin and I locked eyes for a good 30 seconds. Of course, I couldn't see his eyes blink and the robin couldn't see mine blink, but we literally had a stare down and my stare down was the holy encounter of looking at that robin. It was a holy moment of me with God in creation. And then just like that, the robin seemed to just say, you know, I'm tired of you. Okay, this is old. I'm out of here. Took off. Grabbed some thatch nearby to plumb that wonderful nest. It was a wow moment of creation for me. Now more than ever, we need to be thinking about wow moments, but also what we can continue to do to have more wow moments by protecting this planet that we have been given dominion over, as Mary Lou just talked about from scripture. More and more, unfortunately, it seems like creation has been groaning a lot lately under the strain of the human hand on earth. In Romans 8, Paul says, we know that the whole of creation has been groaning in labor pains. Obviously, we didn't have climate change or drastic changes to our environment thousands of years ago when Paul said those words to the early church, but he sure was thinking ahead in some way, shape, or form, it seems like, because it is so apt for the times we ha are seeing today. I think about Ezekiel 34, where I hear these words. It is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet into the rest of your pasture? When you drink of clear water, must you follow the rest with your feet? My friends, creation and all that we see around us are the character of God. We hurt God when we hurt the environment. God is degraded when we degrade our environment. God is hurt when we hurt the earth. I firmly believe that. Creation is groaning, but there's hope. There is hope. I think of 20-year-old Greta Thunberg from Sweden, who was nominated recently for a Nobel Peace Prize for her work in activism and raising alarm over humanity's activities on the environment. Locally, I think our, our young farmers involved in 4-H who are being mentored right now by future farmers. I think of the Seven Ponds Nature Center and other local resources like that designed to help educate us about creation. Let's always never forget that we are called to be God's stewards of this earth that we are blessed to live on. We're called to stand out and speak up with forceful words if necessary, and with actions to protect this creation for our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Remember from Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's, not ours, and that it is in this world that we are blessed to live in. For God has founded the earth on the seas and established it on the rivers. Let's do all that we can for this Mother Earth so we can continue to hear the robins chirping and the earth prospering. When you cut to the chase, let's work to make sure that every day is a good Earth Day. Today 
In our Good Earth Day service, as I said, we focus on this aspect of creation, of course, bees. Bees are a big deal in the Bible. I don't know if you've ever looked that up, but this service gave me a chance to go back and revisit it. Did you know that there are more than 60 verses that mention either bees or honey in the Bible? In Psalm 8, 118, we hear how bees surrounded me like bees. They blazed like a fire of thorns. In Isaiah 7, we hear, It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee, the bee, that is in the land of Assyria. And then there is the mentions about honey. In Deuteronomy 27, we read this from God in regards to the Israelites approaching the land of milk and honey, the promised land. You shall write on them all the words of this law when you have crossed over to the promised land to enter the land that your Lord God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. We have saints in religion, don't we? Well, did you know that there is a patron saint of bees? Yes. His name is St. Ambrose. Now, he was already a patron saint of Milan, Italy, where he was a bishop many years ago. But he also became a patron saint of beekeepers and candle makers. You're wondering, okay, how did he get that moniker? Just so you know, he was born originally as Aurelius Ambrosius in Trier, Germany, to a Roman Christian family around 340 AD. Anyways, Back to why he's associated with bees. His patronage of bees and beekeepers originates from a legend that claims that when he was a little baby, a swarm of bees settled on his face while he lay in a cradle. The swarm left him unharmed, but left a little drop of honey on his face. Bees in general uphold the idea of community. Looking at the spiritual and the religious realm further, we find out that they are often associated with being carriers of wisdom and a fierce spirit despite their delicate physique. In Judaism, honey is considered a kosher food. During the celebration of Rosh Hashanah, it's customary to eat symbolic foods dipped in honey, such as shalah, which is heavened, leavened, rather, bread all in hopes of a happy and healthy new year. Ancient scriptures, by the way, are often used with bee references to describe positive attributes, industry, harmony, wisdom, fertility, good luck. Cut to the chase again. From a spiritual point of view, bees are the winged messengers of the divine. Interesting. In some circles of European folklore, bees and eagles are the only creatures allowed to enter heaven. Besides many religious texts, that many religious texts rather contain allusions to bees and their hives. And archaeologists have found paintings of honeybees inscribed on ancient artifacts like rocks and walls. Yes. Bees are symbolic among ancient Greeks as well. They consider bees to be a cult symbol for Artemis, the goddess of wild nature. Pan, known as the god of beekeeping, is another Greek god associated with bees. Bees are spiritual. Bees are biblical. They help us from going hungry, and they are, as Lisa is going to tell us in a minute, are absolutely critical to our existence because of the role they play in the pollination of plants. Honeybees, for you factoid folks out there, honeybees support approximately 15 billion, that's with a B, 15 billion dollars worth of agricultural crops in the U.S. every year. There are, and Lisa can correct me in just a minute, but I found that there are 20 Thousand, 20,000 distinct bee species around the world, 
4,000 of them alone here in the United States. And nearly one third of our food supply here depends on insect pollination, most of which is accomplished by bees. So what can we do to help bees? Well, we're blessed today to have Lisa, who's gonna tell us about this, to show us what we can do and also help the bees. So Lisa, without further ado, please come on up. And again, we thank you for coming today to be our guest speaker and to tell us what we can do. She's also got a PowerPoint presentation and um, listen to Lisa. She's got some good information for us. Lisa. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Good morning. Um, I know Pastor Dave said it is like you are honored to have me, but I actually feel very much the opposite. <laughs> I, I'm uh, thrilled to be here. It's not often that beekeepers get captive audiences that are not other beekeepers. So I, it means a lot that um, you're interested in doing, you know, learning and trying to do what you can to help this creature. Because uh, it's very, it's, it's not as complicated as you might think. Um, I want to start, I want to tell you about very shortly, briefly, this Reverend Lorenzo Langstroth. I'm going to read this quote to you in a minute. He lived from 1810 to 1895, among other things. He was a beekeeper. He is credited with developing what they call the movable frame hive, uh, which is really the beehive that, when, what com that comes to mind when you think of beehives, these boxes that you see stacked. It's the one most commonly used, certainly in this country. Uh, because of that invention on his part, he is considered the father of modern American beekeeping. He also wrote a book called The Hive and the Honeybee, and which is still very much a resource for beekeepers today. At the beginning of that book, he writes briefly about um, like his mission for writing the book. And included in part of that description is this, hoping that the many wonders of the economy of the honeybee will not only excite a wider interest in its culture, but lead those who observe him, observe them to adore the wisdom of him who gave them such admirable instincts. This, this is exactly how I feel. I couldn't agree more, and it's why I'm grateful to be here and grateful that Pastor Dave was so inspired to make this the topic of his good Earth Day today. So, and I, that is so important to me, and I think it will be to you as you continue to learn, because I suspect that even after our time together this morning, you will be changed in a way, and you will continue to learn not just about honeybees, but about pollinators. Um, and I hope that continues to ring true for you, because like I said, it certainly does for me. Um, so I'm going to start. This is the most wordy slide that I have, uh, and I wanted, even before I describe it, in my presentation here over the next few minutes, I'm going to say a very little bit about a lot of different things, but I hope that you will stay and talk more in greater detail because it is a very broad subject and there's, there's a lot to be said and I certainly don't want to make it the duration <laughs> of the worship service. So that aside, this particular slide, there are eight points. The first four illustrate the magnitude of the contributions that honeybees make to us. Um, Pastor addressed some of these already, so I won't, like item one, I don't know if you said it quite like this, but pollination is vital to about 250,000 species of flowering plants. There are over 100 crops grown in the United States that depend on pollination. Granted, that's all types of pollinators, not just honeybees, but the honeybees are responsible for approximately a one third of the food that we eat due to that crop pollination involvement that they have. So when I talk to young children, usually what I say is, every third bite of food you take, you should be thanking a honeybee. And I go like, um, um, 
Thank you, honeybee. You know, like, but, but, you know, I do think that when we eat, we, we're not thinking, like, we dismiss, like, it doesn't come to mind, but this is, that's a lot of food they're responsible for, for us. Um, point number four, honeybees are the only insects that produce food con consumed by humans. Uh, so there's a lot of pollinators. This particular pollinator has a special place in our lives. Furthermore, honey is the only food stuff that contains all the necessary nu nutrients to sustain life. And I think all of us here this morning will agree that that is no accident. That is just another magnificent example of God's divinity. Okay, now items five through eight are of a different nature. They are some of what's required of honeybees just to sustain themselves. This is how I'm gonna start showing you a little bit more about honeybees. A colony must produce about 60 pounds of honey to feed itself through the winter. In order to produce one pound of honey, worker bees must visit two million blossoms. For every pound of honey produced, a, a honeybee colony must collect 10 pounds of pollen. So I'm not that great at math, but if you do the math, just to, for the colony to have what it needs to sustain itself, it needs to visit 120 million blossoms and bring into the colony 60 pounds of pollen, just for themselves. Yeah, I know, it, they're workhorses, they're amazing. Um, a worker bee may visit up to 2,000 flowers a day, and then its life, lifetime will produce one teaspoon of honey. So with that little bit of reality, I think it becomes more clear how important it is to have strong, healthy colonies with good, like, large populations so they've got the workforce that can get out there and do just what they need to do to survive, to say nothing of creating this substance, honey, that, like I said, contains all the nutrients to sustain life. Okay, very quickly, let's just dive into a beehive like, very briefly. There are three casts of bees in a honeybee colony. There are, and so the upper left picture is an aerial view from like smallest to largest, you see worker, drone, and queen. The center bee, the drone, you can see he's fatter, he's got bigger eyes. The drones live usually a season, and in Michigan, I would say that's like May through October. Their purpose really is to mate with virgin queens. That's what they do. The queen, the longest one on the end, her abdomen is that long because once she takes a series of mating flights when she's new, uh, newly emerged, uh, she'll mate with 10 to 15 drones. And from that time, then she returns to the colony after that. She doesn't leave again unless the colony swarms. There's one queen per colony. But once her mating flights are done, in her is a really genetically diverse amount of sperm to do all the egg laying and fertilization that she does in the colony for the duration of her life. A good, strong queen can live three to five years. Like I said, there's one queen per colony. That's her job, is laying eggs. She lays female eggs, which are the fertilized eggs, and male eggs. That's all she does. And in that process, she emits a lot of different pheromones, a lot of different odors, and those odors, those pheromones, are what drive the worker bees, who are the primary workforce of the colony and the females, to do everything that they do. When she lays eggs, she emits certain smells, and it drives, then the, the worker bees know, okay, we have, we have young to take care of. Every, everything, they live in darkness, right, unless they're out foraging. So all of the work, really, other than mating and laying eggs, is done by the female workers. Their jobs vary depending on how old they are. Usually the younger jobs are nursing, like feeding, feeding the young, nursing, um, even after they emerge, cleaning, uh, taking care of the queen, obviously, because uh, she doesn't do anything for herself. It is at the end of their life that they start leaving, and in, in fact, guarding the colony, too. You, also, you need a good, strong colony to guard from other predators that may come to them, come 
of folks to colony. Um, it's at the end of their life that they start foraging. So when you see them out on flowers, they really are um, at the end of their life. The, the summer workers usually live six to eight weeks. Sometimes you'll see them out on flowers and they look pretty beat up because they've, they've, they're probably more towards that eight week mark. Um, interestingly, I say summer bees because those are the worker bees that are born like August, September are physiologically different. They actually have different, they have more fat bodies on them. So they're designed and they will live longer because they are designed to live through the winter months. So they're even physiologically different. Um, a quick picture in the hive. Um, this is just like a frame of bees, but I wanted to point it out because it's cool. It's a little bit irrelevant, but um, they have actually primarily work for them. of a strong queen. Those workers all around her are called her retinue, they're her caretakers. And when a beekeeper, when you see that, you are relieved because it's an indication that you have a, a very healthy, strong queen. And I really just think that picture's cool and I wanted you guys to see it. Um, this is another <laughs> shot of inside the hive. This is a frame from one of the lower boxes, all of the brood rearing where all the, the bees are, the queen does her laying and the bees are reproduced, happen in the lower boxes of a colony. The upper ones are for honey production. But I wanted you to see this just because it, it's kind of going to be relevant as I talk, get into what some of the problems that they have. So this is, the queen lays like in a ball, like in a center, and she works her way out. If you were to be able to look at like the brood rearing area, it would be a ball, you know, and and around it would be a pollen, and then outside of that would be the honey. So all around that brood rearing area, the bees place everything they need to take care of those young, uh, developing and emerging bees. Um, I think that's all I was gonna say about that. But I like that picture. So what you see in that picture, I'll go back, is like a slice of that ball. And you can see that, that like capped area in the middle. Those are all developing bees. Okay, now, very quickly, here's where things start to come together with what I'm saying. Very quickly, a year in the life of the honeybee. We're just coming out of winter, um, those of us who keep bees. In the winter, the colony clusters in, in a body form and keep the queen warm and they usually will still come, do what they can to keep the hive close to, that, that cluster anyway, close to 95 degrees. Um, you need, a colony needs a lot of bees to pull this off for the duration of the winter. And this is why they need 60 pounds of honey. Coming out of winter into spring, this is where we are right now. I don't know if you can see on that slide coming into a colony and they've got pollen on their legs. When you start to see that in the spring, that is an indica like indication that the queen has, is laying again. She has, she's held off for the winter because they don't have any resources. So that's a very good sign to see. But what happens, <laughs> so, so what they need, so the, the queen has started laying, now you know they need resources. And one of the first resources th of, of both pollen and nectar to emerge in the spring, which is so essential at this time, because if, if they can't, if the queen can't, if they don't have the resources to build up the population, which has dwindled in the winter, they're not gonna have the, the, the workforce that they need to bring in the honey that they need, that, that they have the opportunity to bring in in the summer months. Does that make sense? Every season kind of feeds on the next one with the honeybees. Um, so one of the first pollen and nectar sources is dandelion. And I know everybody hates, to, they see them coming up and they just wanna kill them. I see them and I think, thank you God, right? Because this is what they need. This is the first food source for them at a highly critical time for them. And interestingly about dandelions, when they come up in your lawn, they actually are coming up because 
they, it's been determined by nature that your soil is lacking something, and dandelions are one of the things that are actually trying to bring health back into your soil. Um, so I'm obviously a big fan of keeping the dandelions alive. Um, okay, I touched on summer. Summer for the bees, June, July, is really the peak of resource availability and the peak production time for them for honey, which as they've determined they're gonna need. Once you get into autumn, and these two pictures, I'm, I'm a little autumn section. Um, the yellow is goldenrod, the purple flower are asters. Those are the really the two primary final resources for them. Once those things are done blooming, they really don't have any more resources. So they're, and, and that happens like August, September, that's when the winter bees are emerging in the colony. And so this is when you want a good pot, like a good laying queen, a whole bunch of winter bees that have been emerging. So you want the resource, you want them to have access to these things so they can have, like I said, the workforce and the resources just to be able for them to survive, to say nothing of sustaining us. Okay, now I'm gonna lump their obstacles into just three basic categories. And like I said, all of this we can talk about afterwards. Lack of resources, chemicals, and parasites. Um, lack of resources, a lot of times development will do that. Um, also much, something that I think a lot of people don't realize, when you clear away land to put in pastures, you're taking away, you're gonna put grazers in those pasture areas and they're gonna eat down acres and acres of pollinator habitat. Um, we need all of these creatures, but if you're gonna take something away that's a resource for them, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of putting it back somewhere. Um, chemicals, we could go on about, the, uh, there's, there's not enough time in a day to talk about this, but pesticides and fungicides and herbicides have, they affect the bees in different ways, whether it's killing them outright or being present in the pollen and the honey for generations of their uh, life cycles through the course of a season um, to uh, really affecting their ability to navigate, which is critical because then they, they, they may be able to communicate locations of food to their, the others in the colony, but they're not necessarily gonna be able to get there or get back as they're designed to. Um, third, the third one is parasites. There are a lot of these. I'm only gonna talk about one because it's the primary one and some of the other parasites and pests that affect honeybees are not hard on a colony if the colony is strong. However, the varroa mite is the parasite I'm gonna talk about and I'll, I'll just say briefly what they do and we can talk about it more later. It, it's a, a parasitic mite that attaches to the honeybees and feeds off of their hemolin, their fat stores. Um, and the interesting thing is, this graph, this is why, one of the reasons why they're so detrimental. They harm the developing larva and they harm the bee. But this graph, I don't know if you can see, the yellow line or the upper line is really the growth, population growth of the honeybee through the course of a year. The lower line, which is red, is the population growth of the varroa mite population over the course of the year. And you can see on this graph that as the honeybee's population growth is diminishing, like around July, August, that's when the varroa mite population is at its peak. And the reason this is so critical is that this is, take, this is happening at a time when those winter bees are supposed to be emerging and come out strong and healthy, but they don't because th what these mites do this is an area of brood rearing on a frame. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna come over here. This is just think about the, okay, so as, a, as larva develops, at a certain point it attacks, and that's what mites will do. But what the mites do is they'll hop into these cells where the larva are. A one mite will hop in right, right before it gets attacked and starts feeding on the larva, the cells get trapped, and that, and it's a female, and then she starts reproducing. And then there's this exponential reproduction that happens 
ask, like wants to sell us caps, you can't do anything about it. So what emerges are winter bees that are not physiologically equipped to make it through the winter. Now the burden for addressing this is really on the beekeeper, but I, I would say you, you, <laughs> you are, it's fine for you when you talk to beekeepers to talk to them about what they're doing to monitor and manage the varroa mite. Because right now in beekeeping, you can't get your hives to survive if you don't help them through their exposure to this. And every colony has them. It's, it's the job of the beekeeper to keep those populations down. And, there's, and, you, and it can be done, but it's, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of study and a lot of learning. Um, but there's nothing wrong with you when you talk to beekeepers. To, to, and I'm not saying call them out, but to ask what they're doing and encourage them. If they're doing nothing, encourage them. Because the other problem here <laughs> is that if a beekeeper is not managing this, when the colony is dying, and that picture on the bottom, you're right, bottom right, I don't know if you can tell, but it's an adult bee and you can see mites on it. By the time you can see mites on an adult bee, that colony is as good as dead. But what they do before the colony collapses, they'll take in whatever honey stores they have and then they leave. And they usually show it up at the doorstep of other colonies. And, and if it's August, September, that colony is gonna let them right in because they've got a stomach full of food and they're looking to gather resources for winter. So then they just spread the mite problem to the colonies that they take up residence in. And so the other thing about the varroa mite is that they are vectors for all these other brood diseases and problems. So by controlling the mite, you're actually addressing a lot of other health, health issues that can come up for them. So the objective really for those who don't keep bees is to do what you can to provide like healthy, healthy resources so that it reduces their stress, improves their nutrition, and contributes to the restoration of the resources that they need to do what they do to stay alive and, to, and for us. So here's a few things you can do. We, I could talk forever on this, but that's what later is for. Um, use chemicals sparingly and strategically, if at all. I, I would say don't use them. Um, and by strategically, I mean if you're going to spray or, or spread something to kill a particular, what you, something you think is a nuisance, do it after the, the nectar and pollen uh, production times are for that plant, for that flower. Um, and do it in the evening when the bees have returned to their colonies and aren't out foraging. Uh, consider, I'm a big fan of this, companion planting. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, uh, but I will recommend a really great book called Carrots Love Tomatoes. And I'll give you an example of companion planting. If any of you have ever grown tomatoes, you're familiar with that big fat green tomato hornworm that de really destroys the plant. Well, the borage that Pastor Dave has here today, borage is a companion plant with tomatoes and what it does is uh, repel the tomato hornworm. I've grown those together for a long time. And there's, there's tons of different companions that go together to help, they help each other. And it's an excellent um, alternative to using chemicals, especially if you're a backyard gardener. It's the agricultural arm is a very different thing and there are entities that are actually working to improve communication between beekeepers and high level agricultural industry. So that there's people on that, but for backyard gardening, I, don't, I highly recommend that. Um, plant a bee garden or a pollinator patch. And uh, with that, I say get creative with cover crops. And what I mean is if you have a garden bed or a, that you're, you know you're not gonna get to this year, or you have an area that you're tired of mowing, uh, throw some sort of cover seed in it. Borage is one of them. And, uh, cover crops are types uh, of plants or flowers that actually recondition your soil. So you can, you can throw down some sort of cover seed and return nutrition to the soil, not have to do anything to it, and provide a resource to the bees. 
So also support your local beekeepers. I would say um, it's better for you anyway if you're, a, if you're a consumer of honey. The more local your honey is, the better it's going to be for you managing any allergy problems you have. And don't be afraid to support beekeepers who are really doing their due diligence to manage the varroa problem. Um, lastly, support local, state, and national organizations. This, the two handouts I have for you are the first slide and the last slide, because all of these organizations, they, they, like I said, they range from local to national. I can tell you more about them afterwards because I have experience with all of them, and they are, all seven of these have contributed to my ability to keep bees and to keep them alive, and they, they go above and beyond. So. Anything you need to know about flowers, gar uh, any about how you can help the bees, there's just an, a treasure trove of information you can get through these resources. And I, like I said, we can talk in far greater detail about all of these things after the service. Thank you so much. Lisa, thank you, and as again, she'll be here after the service, and again, don't go away empty-handed because we have some wonderful seeds to send you home with today to get your backyard efforts going um, and plant, of course, after the frost season is over, which seems to be hanging on. So for now, uh, let us sing two verses, verses 1 and verses 3 of hymn number 31, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. And let us pray. God, this morning on this Good Earth Sunday, we thank you for all the parts of creation that make our lives better and that help feed us. We thank you for the bees. May we especially come away from our service and our fellowship today enlightened about what we can do to help bees, to help this critical part of your creation for generations to come. Lord, we thank you for coming here safely, and we ask that you bring us home safely today. We thank you for family and friends, for children and grandchildren. Lord, we thank you for all those around us that support us and help us, people we know and don't know that have done and continue to do things to help us, protect us. Our men and women in the military, the doctors, the nurses, the hospital bed cleaners. Lord, we thank you for the beekeepers, for those that work to educate us about this part of your creation and the bees. Lord, we are a suffering people. There are people here today suffering in our midst. Bring comfort to them and bring comfort to us in our darkest days and our longest nights. 
And Lord, as we always do every Sunday, we ask you to bring peace to where there is conflict in our earth. We pray for an end to the war in Ukraine. We pray for an end to strife in the Middle East. And Lord, now we pause and say to you, either silently or out loud, our own prayers and petitions to you. Pray for Thelma's family. Pray for the Bennett family. Pray for protection for Oleksii and Vladimir and Dennis in Ukraine. Having received our petitions, Lord, please hear us now as we say together the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please rise. Please join me in saying our offertory prayer. God, whose giving knows no ending, we offer up the treasure that you have entrusted to us. We offer up skills and time you have given to us. We offer ourselves in service and praise. Receive these offerings and use them through the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish Christ's work of love in the world. Amen. Now, my friends, for the sake of the bees, for the sake of all of God's creation, and for ourselves, let us resoundingly and loudly sing our closing hymn, number 28, For the Beauty of the Earth. <laughs>
friends, on this table are seedlings that I'll be bringing into Fellowship Hall and fixing you up with after the service to help our bees. Uh, just two quick reminders, you're going to be given a pot of either sunflowers or borage and seed packets of the plant that's not in the pots. And then Steve has also blessed us with some wonderful marigold seeds. So there will be no excuse, right, for you to go home after the frost season, of course, and plant these and use them. Hear now this blessing of these seeds today for the bees. Creating God before you here today are these seedlings. Bless them, nourish them, protect and bless them. For these seedlings are, will soon be sown in hope. And may these seedlings, these wonderful seedlings, bring forth bountiful flowers to help the bees. Go now, my friends, to love and serve the Lord and to protect the bees. Amen. <laughs>